Got it. Okay, this time I'll try to keep the slides up with my notebook. <laughs> Please <don't laughs> So we're gonna um, we're gonna look at at Hannah's song, which I didn't teach in at St. Anne's because I didn't know that I could hold the students' attention long enough. Uh, but I think you guys can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> so the the introduction to the song occurs right after um, uh, Hannah turns her child over to Eli. This was also very hard to do at St. Anne's because um, it, you know, the kids don't like the idea that you can give your child away. <laughs> it's a little unnerving for them. So, um, so we would talk about how it would be done and how she would visit and all that kind of thing to make it better. But so for this child, I prayed and the Lord granted me the petition that I made of him or to him. And therefore I have lent him and I, I kind of halt over the word lent, but I lent him, that would be Samuel, to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. And she left him there for the Lord. Um, which is quite a deal. Um, and I'm not sure he would have been that young. I'm sure he would have been at least seven. Um, and I'm sure there would have had to be some connection with him with the mom it would be too traumatic but maybe they didn't care <laughs> anyway Hannah prayed and said my heart exalts in the Lord my strength is exalted in my God my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory so uh, part of what she says she may have sort of expropriated created from a psalm, <laughs> um, which would be this one. But um, so who are the enemies that she derides? Really? I mean, the women who derided her? It's kind of a pretty hard thing, I think, to name the people who put you down as your enemies. It would be easy if you were a teenager, but I don't know about, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? No? <laughs> no what was the uh, chapter and verse for this again? Uh, this is uh, Samuel 2, I think, roughly. find it yes now what verse do you remember well it should be in song form it should be pretty obvious in a translation uh. oh is it first samuel or second Samuel? oh, oh i'm sorry first uh, first samuel chapter okay. sorry in the microwave Anyway, and the, t the tone is militaristic in, you know, it's enemies and victory. And, um, and that's probably because there are other songs in the Bible, not just, we're going to look at Mary, uh, the song that Mary sings in relation to this, but we're not going to look at Miriam's song. Miriam sings when uh, the, the Red Sea closes over the enemy army and the people are all on the other side and safe and free now of Egypt, Egypt. And so she sings one that's pretty military. Uh, and it may be that, that, you know, the words were kind of borrowed. I'm uh, a little bit, but- Mary, I anyway, wonder about the is, enemies might be, you know, in those, in those days, they believed that if you were Un, un, unwell um, that was you know demons or the devil or something uh -huh. and maybe the enemies she's talking about are the enemies that caused her barrenness 
Yes. Because it's, the deliverance was a child. Yeah. And so maybe it was those forces, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. um, that, that kept her barren rather than, you know, the bitchy women and the mean men. Yeah. That would make, I would feel better about that. <laughs> I hope, I hope you're right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it is kind of, it comes off pretty, pretty harsh to start with. There is a pattern here. Um, I don't know if you noticed in her story, but, but there is a pattern. Um, you pour out your heart to God in prayer. Then you recognize God's answer when it comes. That's a big one. I don't know many of us if we can do that. <laughs> we give your all back to God as a response, and then you give God praise. And she's reached sort of the final step in the pattern. Um, but that's that's the story of Hannah in a if you're looking for the pattern. Well, and that's the pattern in a lot of I mean that's the pattern with with Sarah, as I recall, and her barrenness. It's a pattern with Elizabeth and her bar barrenness and you know. Yes, it is. So yes, it is, and it's it's a pattern for anybody, I think, uh, whether it's barrenness yeah. or not, uh, or not a woman either. I mean, you know, yeah, it's kind of universal, but it is. But it's, a it's a pattern that is that you see over and over again. Is what I was getting at. Yes. Well, yes. and I think number three is is important and unique because it contradicts the human. Um, or a parent human re natural response to be greedy, you know, to, oh, I found gold, it's mine, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a little counterintuitive to pray for something, get it, and then hand it back. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's pretty significant in people of faith, I think. Um, that is easy to kind of say, well, yes, of course she did, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's not an of course there. That is a, sometimes a difficult choice, but it's also, you know, that kind of giving that, that hopefully we think about when we think about Christian stewardship, which is we give because we can't not, not because we must. Yes. You know, to be so grateful, to be so overjoyed, to be so blessed that out of that abundance, we can give back. Or abundantly or out of total humility and gratitude that, that well out of god's abundance and out of our humility and gratitude right you know there isn't any other thing you know you're looking for something to do and and the only choice actually when you give back to god is to is to give back to other human beings because that's right the only way. right but you know that isn't how the whole world you know, would navigate this pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, I need this. Oh, good. I've got it. Now I'm going to go enjoy my, you know, <laughs> yacht and my this and my that and my whatever. Um, well, so now I'm going to ask for the next big thing. I mean, yeah. you see that pattern too. Oh, God, give me, please give me. Oh, I've got the yacht. God, please give me a captain to put on the yacht. Oh, God, please. You know, and God, give me everybody else's yachts, too. There's some there's some good uh, moral children's stories around that. Yeah. Um, but then the other thing I was thinking um, is, uh, just a sec, I just lost it. Let's see if it comes back. Um Oh, you know, the, the TV evangelists who, who pray about, you know, cast your waters and, or cast your bread upon the waters and, they're not doing it for you to glorify God. That, that's, that is a total economic exchange for you to benefit for you. Coming across in a sheep's clothing. You know, that's not Christian theology. It's just not the Christian theology I understand. Yeah. 
Well, and that leads to the whole thing of the people who don't have people who don't have food to eat or a roof over their heads, that they aren't right with God and therefore right. they deserve their suffering. Yeah, all that wonderful and, and all kinds of nasty stuff that way. Yeah. Well, let's go on. There is no holy one like the Lord. And remember, and I didn't quite get it printed out right on this one, but uh, in the Bible, when you've got a capital L and then they're, they're smaller caps, and I didn't do it here, but um, it is a capital L and then capital R, capital R, or R, excuse, capital O, R, and D, but in a slightly smaller font. That is where the word is substituted for Yahweh. Um, and the letters in Hebrew spell Yahweh, Yahweh, but they do not, that isn't what anyone reading it aloud would say. They, they would say Adonai, which is the Greek word for Lord. And, okay. and, and what would they have said before they spoke Greek? Um, they would have said Lord. Um, in, in Hebrew? In Hebrew. Okay. I was just... You know, I, I presume, but uh, that's what is well, happening. I thought, I thought it was like Dumbledore or like um, Voldemort. It was someone who you didn't say the name of the Lord. Right. right. That's why you don't say Yahweh. That's yeah. Why we don't have it even printed that way. Yeah. So there is a, no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. It's interesting that rock is capitalized. Uh, talk no more so very so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. I I found this picture to show arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. Yeah, the other ones were too violent. They were awful. <laughs> but anyway, um, so she's praising God. And also showing what is the result of having a relationship with God, which is a lack of arrogance. Um, so what is the relationship between godliness and arrogance or between or between God or godlessness, godlessness and arrogance or godliness and humility? I think it's gratitude. Okay. Is it possible to have humility without having a relationship with God? I think so. I do too. I think, uh, well, for me, I have to avoid saying my way or the highway, so to speak. Stay open to whatever more wisdom, since this is the Sunday of wisdom. Uh, she, wisdom, I love that, decides to make available for my perception. I wonder if it's possible to have uh, humility but simply be unaware of your relationship with God. I don't know that you can have relation that you can have humility without a relationship to God, but I think you can be unaware. Hmm. Interesting thought. I mean, if we're being humble to, to, to whom or what are we measuring? Hmm. You know, what are we, what are we comparing ourselves to, to be humble? We need to talk to an atheist or, or an agnostic, see what they say. <laughs> yeah, but I just, you know, again, they may have a relationship with a higher power that they are unaware of. Ah. The agnostic probably wouldn't offer an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think just looking at historic figures, Gandhi was certainly someone who had humility, I think, as part of his 
I don't need to be seen or to be heard. I'm concerned because my face is not in the picture. <laughs> Robert does that intentionally, so. Good idea. Well, anyway, there. so it's gratitude. I think it's also an awareness of perhaps our absolute minuscule status in the presence of something as as universal as God or as as commanding as God that that keeps the humility in place you know when you when you begin to get an ego you just sort of have to check it off and say well wait a minute <laughs> but um hmm. anyway but I think I've met people that would say they didn't believe in God Yet we're humble. You're going on. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, and the feeble gird on strength. So I got some illustrations for that. <laughs> but <laughs> There was an Anu an Anubis of Egyptian uh, sort of top four would uh, weigh the soul of a person who had just recently died against the weight of a feather. And the weight of the soul would have, you know, gravitas based on how much good you had done in the world. Um, and there were few who would pass this test. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they when they use the word weighed in in uh, the Hebrew Bible, I think they're still maybe harking back to this idea, but um, I don't know. There's apparently a story in the Book of Mormon about a broken a broken uh, uh, bow and a different story altogether, and that's where this illustration or what this illustration was made for. And then, of course, feeble to gird on strength. Was, I don't know if you've seen Captain America, but that does happen. <laughs> the Lord is... Yes? Excuse me? Okay. The Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble gird on strength. Again, militaristic. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The baron has borne seven, but she who has many children is Forlorn. This painting on the on the the left uh, is somebody's illustration of Elizabeth meeting Mary. Um, the Lord killed. Excuse me. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down the shield, or he brings down to. Sh Shield and raises up. And let me get this picture up. The idea of how the world, the cosmology of the Bible is that there are waters above and below. There's a dome that protects us from the water above. Um, otherwise, we would have floods. And then under the, the earth is this place for the dead. But also, you'll see um, support for the earth, and those are the pillars of the earth. Um, and that's the thing to which she's referring to is Sheol. It's not a hell, it's just a place. The Lord makes... The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. I 
I don't know that that uh, is it Megan that she was ever that poor, but. <laughs> The pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. And this is a, a more graphic illustration of the, uh, of the situation, uh, the cosmology of, of the Old Testament. We, have a, we don't see that slide. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions about that? <laughs> what is Sheol? Sheol is a place for the dead. Oh. Um, it is a place of darkness. And um, and I, the next illustration might, might give you an idea. But um, Reform Judaism uh, believes in uh, immortality as we do it's just not so hard to get there you're not going to be particularly judged or whatever it just happens um, so I don't know to what degree that was thought in Hannah's day or in the day that this was written whatever day that was Your son, uh, so the pillars of the earth is that the basis for the long standing belief that the earth was flat Probably, yeah, probably. They saw they could see the roundness of the earth in the heavens, but it was flat after that. <laughs> so the, well, I'm just reading something in Borg about uh, literal and metaphorical, and um, so that's why I'm I'm bringing it up that um, this is their picture of the world, but it. Because it was really a problem amongst the religious when uh, scientists were discovering that the world really wasn't flat. Or that, that the earth would, didn't dominate the sun or, you know, all of those things. Or that the rocks were older than, than the Bible would allow. Yeah. Um, I can't hear you, Irma. Can anyone hear Irma? No, no. I wonder if Irma can hear us. <laughs> what was the date of this? What century? Well, her century would have been um, probably about 900 AD. The book itself probably has a closer relationship to um, maybe 750 AD, or in BC, excuse me, BC. Um, let's see, she'd be, not, yeah, 750, and probably edited finally in, in Babylon, so that would be 550. Okay. Irma, we still can't hear you. <laughs> Irma, do you have the sound turned off on your computer? She's talking like crazy. Well, we'll have to go. Hmm. Okay. So let's see. What do we do the feet thing? Yeah. yeah. We will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in the darkness. So this is what you might suffer if you were truly bad. You would go to Sheol, but it, there's no fire or anything. It's just you're going to live in darkness. Um, for not by might does one prevail. Feet. What? What about feet? What about feet? You will guard the feet. Now, one of the things that I thought of, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones. Uh, feet don't usually need much guarding, but um, there is a custom in the Old Testament of 
talking, referring to the feet when you're referring to genitals. And so maybe that's what needs guarding. <laughs> um, I don't know. That would make the wicked chubby cut off in darkness pretty grim. <laughs> well, two thoughts, Mary. One is that movement from place to place was very important at that time. And the yeah. other is you lost your feet and you couldn't walk, then you were pretty much a useless yeah. part of the community. That's what I thought too. Yeah. Also, I think in, you know, if you're in a shield wall and you're fighting again, it's military, but uh, that yes. is one of the vulnerable places. Um, do you know what I mean by a shield wall? Everyone has a shield and they make a wall of their shields right. and fight in a, in a cohort. Um, but Well, and maybe it's not so much as guarding the feet, but guarding the direction of the feet. Oh, lead us not, you, you know, lead us, lead us not in the wrong directions or. Hmm. Good job. So if you cut off, had your feet cut off, you'd become directionless? I don't, I think you'd stop moving. <laughs> the Lord, shall I go on? The Lord, his adversary shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. The thing to note here, though, is that at that time there was no king or anointed one. So is this one of those places where the book of Samuel gets anachronistic because they're mm -hmm. piecing it together? Or does this serve some kind of literary purpose? Should we look at Hannah's statement as less of a personal statement and more of a pronouncement from God? Which would be a prediction? Or is there another way to look at this? I haven't, I'm not done with the Borg book on reading the Bible. <laughs> yeah, for the time. So, I don't know yet. Well, oh, I, think, okay. <laughs> I think it's something that you can, when you're looking at the New Testament alongside the, these stories, you can see it as foretelling in a way or just forward looking so maybe predict predicting mm -hmm. is, a good, is it one way to view it uh, the, what she says may be inspired the same way that sort of what mary was saying will be inspired well was this a time, was this this at that time when they were were begging for a king and weren't getting a king just before that time. Just before Some that, okay. Be there for that to take place. So okay. it's just before that time. He's the last, Samuel's the last judge. Um, okay. okay. I always get that confused. Yeah. So there's no king yet. So let's look at Mary's Magnificat because there may have been some I mean, it may have been that Mary's Magnificat was there only because Hannah's song was there, or maybe because Miriam's song was there. But anyway, before. Um, Elizabeth in, is saying, um, she's gone to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth has affirmed that the baby inside of her is, is the one they've been waiting for. And her own, Elizabeth's own child, which is also in her womb, leaps with joy uh, at the presence of Mary and this baby. So Elizabeth says, and blessed is she who believed there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices. 
in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. So again, maybe partly because she's a woman and Hannah is a woman, they're just overwhelmed by the fact that God is responding to them at all in their time of need. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. I had a hard time finding mercy pictures. Most of them was, um, we will have no mercy. <laughs> so. He has shown Strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. And it's proud in the thoughts of their hearts, so they don't even have to be showing their pride, um, <laughs> apparently. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And again, we've got David who will bring Saul down from his throne, but that's not happened yet. 74 more days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. Um, is this heaven? Hmm, on earth, maybe? Is She's proclaiming it. So you're thinking, yes, this would be the time when, uh, when the judgment had occurred? if that was what you were looking for, if you expected judgment. Because this isn't what we see today. No, but she is, she's saying it's coming and it's actually a major theme of the book of Luke. Now you can read it. The rising up of the lowly and the debunking of the wealthy. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made our ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Mary, it just crossed my mind that maybe uh, we are thinking uh, I shouldn't say we, but maybe I was thinking more of um, a physical rather than a psychological world. Uh, when you're thinking of people rising up, maybe thinking, well, they, they have more bread to eat or something like that, instead of that their, their worldview has opened and is richer. Mm -hmm. She's certainly proclaiming the physicality, I think, of it. Um, there's certainly other things. If you have, at the time, you'd ha almost, you almost couldn't mediate God yourself. It was done by, by the rather rich and arrogant um, priests in the temple. There wasn't a lot you could do um, for yourself until Jesus kind of blew that open. Um, and and offered religion, faith in God to everyone in a, in a way that it hadn't been done in a long time, at least in Israel. So that does change. The comparison of Hannah's song with the Magnificat, both are sung by women who bore miraculous children, who in turn became agents of change for Israel. Both introduced the major themes of the book to follow. 
this new king in, in Samuel, this, uh, the rising of the lowly, the pulling down off thrones of the, of the powerful, both affirm God's power and ultimate control of history. Both predict that God will raise up the lowly and bring down the powerful, and both specifically predict that God will feed the hungry while making it hard for the formerly wealthy to even to find food. So, there may have been some, uh, it is possible that the author of Luke used Hannah's song as a model for Mary's. Mark, Samuel marks the end of the era of judges and the beginning of the era of kings, Anna hails the beginning of this great change. Luke, an historian, believed that Jesus also initiated a new era in history, and the story of the birth of John the Baptist demonstrates what religious life was like in the old era, centered around the worship and the temple. With the birth of Jesus, a new era begins. And in Luke's gospel, that transition is completed when the curtain of the temple is torn in two. And thus Mary's song also hails the beginning of great change. Well, we have a little bit of time and I think we can do the story, just the story, it's just a story um, of well, uh, I, there's one question here. Maybe we need to do that. Or maybe not. Which song do you like better? <laughs> or do you? <laughs> maybe you don't like any of them. <laughs> which, are you saying which story? Or no, which interpretation? Or... I don't know which which song do you think is more powerful? I like Mary's song. We know it better. <laughs> well, we know it better, but if it's foretelling kingdom of heaven on earth, um, it's a beautiful vision. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to the story of Samuel, the boy. What else? Someone else? I was just saying that Mar I thought Hannah, Mary's story um, reinforces Hannah's or retells Hannah's. So maybe that's what, and, and we know it better. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the story of what happened to Samuel. And in this story, we have the two sons of, of Eli in contrast with this little boy who is, being, who is rising up uh, in the temple and uh, ultimately will take the place of the place that Eli's son should have taken. Um, so Eli was a good priest, but his sons were not. Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, treated the offerings that the people made to the Lord with great disrespect. When a worshiper tried to burn the fat of the meat of the Lord, these two sons would stop the process and take the fat for themselves. Apparently, they were not worried about cholesterol. Um, but... <laughs> um, this was what they did. Um, um, could I make a, just a cultural comment? Sure. In, um, in Kyrgyzstan, I used to go down to a butcher and they had um, ground beef, especially for Europeans, and it didn't have fat. And then they had these bowls of this more fat 
this meat that was mostly all fat. And that's what the Kyrgyz and probably the Uzbeks um, wanted. Preferred, yeah. Preferred. So the fat was something really special. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're going to work all day, um, really work hard all day, that will fuel you more than lean meat would. Um, but, so, and using a long fork, they would actually send their servants uh, to take the best meat or the best of the meat at people were, that people were offering to the Lord and they ate it themselves. Um, so they were stealing the offerings. Let's see. <sighs> Meanwhile, Samuel was growing up in the temple. He learned how to properly perform temple ceremonies. He learned how to read and he wore robes that his mother sewed for him. And that would be a linen robe, which is translated ephod, but I don't think it's the, the actual dressing that, that a priest would wear in the temple. It was just the, maybe the alb and not the um, chasuble. When she brought the linen robe to him, he would bless her saying, may the Lord repay you with many children. And the Lord took note of Hannah, and she bore three sons and two daughters. Now Eli was very old, and he heard reports that his sons were drinking and carousing too much. Um, carousing was what I told the children, that they were actually um, sleeping with the women that were supposed to be serving in the temple. Um, doing the work around the temple. Anyway. Um, Eli scolded them saying they offended the Lord. Let's see, am I on the right page? No. Eli scolded them and saying that they were scolded them saying that Oh, I'm getting an echo. There would be no one in the community who will pay for the to pay for God to forgive or pray for God to forgive them when God finally shows how angry God is. And he warned he warned them, and they didn't listen. He apparently could not curb them. And finally one day a man of God came to Eli, and this man of God is very strange. Um, he's not in the temple service. He's just some kind of wandering prophet, came to Eli and prophesied, your two sons will die by the sword on the same day. Speaking for God, this man went on to say, I will raise up for myself, this would be God speaking, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest and he will go in and out before my anointed one forever. And again, there was no, um, and again, there was no anointed one, meaning no king yet. The people had been ruled only by judges so far. So this was an odd statement, an, an odd prophecy, a foretelling of the future of Israel. Okay. Now there are people who say that when you have a man of God show up in one of these old stories, that was probably the Deuteronomist adding um, somebody to move the plot along, but also to hold that uh, the raising up of the monarchy and uh, the, the punishment that God would inflict on those who were not obedient to him. It would be something the Deuteronomist would do 
Um, and so they think perhaps this wasn't part of the original story, just something to help with the plot. So that they added. Those in your family will live on after your, who live on after your sons will die will be begging uh, this faithful priest for food because they will be widowed and orphaned and destitute. So now we have the, the rich um, looking for food as Hannah predicted. After that, Eli did not receive any more messages from God either uh, from people or from God, God's self. Eli's eyesight grew dim and after dark he stayed in his room because he could not see to get around. Sounds like cataracts to me. And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle outside where the Ark of the Covenant rested. I don't think he'd camp out in the actual Holy of Holies, behind the tent, behind the screen, that is. One night he awoke and a voice to a voice calling, Samuel, Samuel. And the boy immediately got up. I don't here. Go back. And the boy immediately got up and ran to Eli's side. And he woke Eli up saying, here I am for you called me. However, Eli responded, I did not call you, go lie down. The voice again called Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli, and Eli informed Samuel that Eli had not called. Samuel returned to his bed, and again the voice called his name, and he ran to Eli. And this time... Eli perceived that the Lord must be calling the boy. Eli said that Samuel was to go lie down. If he heard the voice again, Samuel should reply, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the voice did call a fourth time, and Samuel replied, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What is interesting here is how faithful Eli is, uh, knowing that his sons are not qualified, um, but not, not letting that keep him from doing um, what needed to be done, which was to help this boy, if this is whom God had chosen to hear. And God then said, I'm about to do something in Israel. On that day, I will fulfill all that I have spoken against Eli. I will punish his house because his sons have blasphemed God. And I will punish Eli because he did not restrain them. So in the morning, Samuel opened the door. Anachronistic, there shouldn't have been any door in that tent. But, um, oh well. Daniel opened the door of the house of the Lord in the morning, and Eli called to Samuel to called Samuel to him. Eli then said, "What was it the Lord told you? Do not hide any of it from me." So Samuel told him. I'm sure he was reluctant. I think he loved Eli as a grandfather figure, I'm sure. But, um, you know, why would you want to tell him such bad news? <laughs> um, Eli responded, after he heard what An uh, Samuel told him, Eli responded, it is the Lord. Let it do what seems good to him. Which is a tremendous statement. Um, he did not deny or obstruct, um, and instead he devoted his life to helping this young man. So, Samuel grew up with the Lord speaking to him, and Samuel shared all the Lord's words. And Samuel became known as a trustworthy prophet, and through Samuel, no longer Eli, 
the word came to Israel. Samuel may have been about eight years old. This is the time of the judges. So in essence, this little boy was in charge of the whole nation. <laughs> and that's the story. Um, how Samuel got his start. Do do any of you know? Excuse me. Go ahead, Renee. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> I didn't say anything, Mary. I was muted. It wasn't me. Um. I'm, I, I know this is a story. How many of you know this story and had heard it many times? I mean, it's it's part part of the lectionary, but. Um, <laughs> So um, I think I'm more impressed with Eli than I am the boy at this point. Um, I just think it's wonderful that Eli immediately recognizes what God is doing, does not fight it, does not claim it's not, does not claim that this is wrong, does not to try to defend himself or his sons, but just devotes himself to whatever it is that God's doing next. Um, and that is just such a tremendous gift. Um, so I'm more impressed with Eli, actually, than I am <laughs> at this point with the boy, although the boy is quite interesting. Um, so... I think for a while, Eli covered for the boy, uh, probably received the word from the boy and didn't make the kid the object of attention uh, until he was older. Um, and just, I just think he, he just did everything that you would have had to do if you have such a young prophet. Um, I don't know how... Samuel may have felt <laughs> about all of this. It may have seemed kind of weird. <laughs> well, is it like being a prodigy? I mean, who has a mentor and the mentor is all about developing the prodigy's skills, like in music? Hopefully the mentor is about developing the boy as well as the skills. Oh, um, well, I don't know if... <laughs> A lot of things, I think, just get get used in in adult thrill over having such kids around. But so maybe Eli was different in that way. Mm -hmm. I think I think he was. He probably didn't know any better as far as the other kids. You know that he was he was special. And he was called. I don't know how many other kids would have been hanging out in Shiloh. Yeah. <laughs> but I would bet you that uh, Eli would speak for God for a long time covering where these words were actually coming from. Um, I would, I just, it would just have to be. This uh, reminds me of the anecdotal story I heard last night in Biden's speech where he said his uh, grandpa told him to keep the faith and his grandma said, no, spread the faith. <laughs> <laughs> but that was really good. But the whole interaction between Eli and Sam. Well, this is the only thing Samuel knew. So he wouldn't have thought it was unusual, you know, maybe. It was just the way things were in his world. Maybe. Maybe. I've often thought Jesus also would have been such a prodigy. And in fact, that story about the boy in the temple, I think, covers that. Um, that he would have been. I've often thought that 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 
that having, you know, that his going to the temple, and if this story is true, and we have the litter, you know, we have reasons to wonder, but um, that the, the rabbis who spoke with him would have taken an interest in being sure that he was developed properly um, for future, you know, to be a rabbi, or to, just, it just seems to me that they would have had to do that they couldn't just let such a person drift back to nazareth without unless any. they were so threatened by well this I prodigy they were amazed at him at that point i don't think he threatened them in any you know i they didn't mention being um being the sort of the nasty priest that he might have met later on um, anyway i've often thought that well, I think we've gotten into the stories of Samuel and um, gotten a, a taste of, of the things about Samuel, about the book itself that are kind of um, not quite right. And, and if the story were, were whole, it, it, it's, you can see some of the piecing being done. Um, anyway, to next time um we'll continue i guess <laughs> yeah. hope so thank you mary mary thank you mary you're welcome i hope you and yeah and let me know if you have any ideas about what i should do better i'll be happy to try <laughs> bye, bye.